Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! We will hopefully have room for a couple of round robins. That's entirely up to you. I can't control this sort of thing myself. I'm drawn to the homelessness question, but not enough, I don't think, to dedicate a whole hour to it today. Because what I really want to work out, and I don't know how we're going to be able to do this together, is um, how many people with jobs are sleeping rough. There's a, I, I don't want to give too much away because it may be a little, I don't know, it may just, I just have a sense it may have a, a, a unpleasant ramifications, but there is a, a small, I'd call it an encampment, I suppose, of homeless people within walking distance of this studio. They found a little corner where they bed down every night, and I am 90% certain, because I drive past the same corner every morning, I'm 90% certain that they're getting up for work. Um, because of what they're wearing, because of the regulation and routine with which they operate, and because of a, I don't know, just a general air of busyness, whereas there are other homeless people in, in London, and I'm sure every other city in the land, where people are whacked out on spice by the time the rest of us have poured milk on our Weetabix. These gentlemen seem to me to be preparing for a day's work. And there's something fundamentally rotten, isn't there, if we are now living in a country while still bleating about the European Union and foreign aid. We're actually living in a country where people with jobs can't afford homes. I hope that's an exception rather than a rule, and I hope I find a way in the coming days or early next year to address it properly. But I, I want to talk about something else that I think speaks to a sense, a growing sense of, of profound change in our country, tectonic plates shifting beneath our feet while we're all looking in the wrong direction, urged to look in the wrong direction by precisely the kind of people who stand to make a shed load of cash from the rising dominance of Uber. If I, do you ever do this? Do you ever step back and think, wow, that, that's normal now? That's not, how can that be normal? Because I, I look at George Osborne and think, what, what, I thought we lived in a representative parliamentary democracy. I thought we lived in a kind of society that, that valued fairness and equity. Well, I, I think you must be a cretin, James, if you think like that. I look at George Osborne. I want no personal beef with the man, but obviously the austerity policies that he introduced and presided over had a hell of a lot more to do with the um, sense of not being well looked after and not having enough that much of the country feels. A hell of a lot more to do with George Osborne's austerity than to do with uh, migration from the EU or any of the other red herrings that were thrown at you by racist liars in that campaign. I look at George Osborne and Uber... And the £650,000 a year that he trousers for one day's work a week with the hedge fund that holds one of the largest investments, if not the largest investment in Uber. And, and I just sit there and think, how, how can that be allowed to happen? Hasn't David Cameron got a new gig running a fund that's going to be investing in China? I, you, ever, you ever feel that you should have been a cheat from the start? Do you ever feel that you've been an absolute... This is one of the problems with religion, actually, which we may talk about later in the program. What Christianity strives to teach you is that you get your reward in the next world. You won't get many rewards in this world for trying to do the right thing. Look at a former prime minister setting himself up as a kind of... Uh, I don't know what you'd call it. He's, he's just trying to make loads and loads of money out of deals with China. And a former chancellor who now edits the London Evening Standard, the newspaper that is supposed to represent Londoners, but is in the hole to a fund that's neck deep in Uber to such a degree that the chances of getting any objective coverage of that very important and urgent issue are, to my mind, pretty much zero. Strange. Just, just, you know what I mean, don't you? When you take one step back and you look at something. Like, for example, David Davis leaving the first day of negotiations of our European Union exit early to have dinner with a newspaper editor. You sit there and you think, hang on a minute, do I actually live in a representative democracy or do I live in some form of oligarchy? George Osborne, all of these people. I digress slightly, but you'll indulge me for a moment. It's not even ten past ten yet. What I'd like to talk about is something that you possibly understand better than I do. The decision this morning by the European Court of Justice regarding Uber seems to me to be rather good news for black cab drivers. I've been ploughing a very lonely furrow. In fact, I have in recent weeks began to wonder whether I had gone a bit bonkers. Because I am convinced that the ultimate 
ill of Uber is the retrospective removal of rights, terms and conditions that every taxi driver in the land, or at least in London, was believing to be sacrosanct when they took the decision to invest thousands of pounds and years of their lives in setting themselves up in a hackney carriage. Now, the deal was that only they and only they would ever be allowed upon the streets of this city and other cities to um, drive around looking for someone with their hand in the air, which is called plying for trade. My, my, my fundamental, I felt like such an anorak on this one, because it seems to me to be fundamental to all of the things we just discussed. If, if you let them remove the rights that you've got without so much as a buy your leave, they're not really rights at all. And while it might seem a little odd to hold up taxi drivers as um, uh, uh, kind of poster boys for social equality, that they really are, I think, on this occasion, the best available example. You can look at firefighters' pensions; it becomes a little bit more, um, a little bit more difficult to unpick. You can look at, I think, teachers probably have got a grievance in this area. Many workers with pension provisions that have been retrospectively unpicked. But fundamentally, as a citizen, as an ordinary worker, you have got, you've got to feel that. If the authorities, the government, local or national, um, are allowed to turn around and tell you that the rights you thought you'd got for life are worthless, that should be a matter of national emergency. And when, when the reason why those rights are worthless looks to be the enhanced profiteering of a company in which a former Chancellor of the Exchequer represents a significant investment and which many people felt was given free reign to ride roughshod over the rights and livelihoods of ordinary British people when that Chancellor of the Exchequer was in Downing Street. One of David Cameron's key advisors' wives was running Uber for a while, or certainly very high up there. And again, I, I don't know. Is this is this Trumpish? Is this if, if you're of a sort of Donald Trump supporting view and you're not very rich? Are you, are you sitting there now going, "Ah, oh, shut up! Let the rich people do whatever they want. Don't let them do whatever they want. You don't get it, you communist. Let the rich people do whatever they want, and then we can have the crumbs from their table." Which is a fairly apt description of the tax bill that got passed by the Senate last night. The, 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 the logic of it is: let's give loads more to rich people. We'll give a, a temporary tax cut to middle class people, but after eight years, they're going to be paying more tax than they are now. We'll give massive tax cuts to corporations and to billionaires will give them tax cuts on their private jets. And I don't know what word to use to describe the people who, who are not wealthy, but they sit there cheering because they think more crumbs are going to fall from the table of the plutocrats. These are really strange times that we live in. And on the one hand, it's great because it gives us lots to talk about. On the other hand, it's chilling because you can't help wondering what might be on the horizon, especially with the, obviously, the best weapon that these profiteering plutocrats have is racism because that's what they use to convince poor people that they're somehow on the same side and the enemy is actually you know, Poles or Muslims or Pakistanis or Romanians uh, or, or in America, Mexicans and, and, and Muslims. Yes, we're all on the same side. I'm going to pick your pocket while we both get cross with that brown person over there. All of this stuff seems to me to be moving in, in similar directions but the Uber ECJ story just puts a little pause on that and represents, or at least recognises, that the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice today has delivered extremely good news to Britain. And when I describe Britain in the way that I just did with regard to George Osborne, and while we still have an independent judiciary, despite what some newspapers are quite happy to, to publicly wish for, we still have an independent judiciary, I can't shake a feeling, a suspicion that if the Chancellor of the Exchequer is essentially um, counting the days until he leaves Downing Street and takes up an incredibly lucrative job with a fund that's heavily invested in Uber, I can't help wondering whether Uber felt in some way that their interests had been well served by a previous administration, which is why the European Court of Justice and its supra-national status is so valuable and so important. But arguably that ship has sailed. Um, does anyone want to remind me what I've just said for 10 minutes? I seem to have gone off in about a million different directions. I've got absolutely no idea what, 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 what you're going to ring in and 
talk to me about, so I should reset very briefly with a nice question, which is this. Uber is officially a transport company and not a digital service, um, the European Court of Justice has ruled. You'll remember Uber also remains um, licensed, suspended under appeal in the City of London. This story, this move comes after a taxi driver's association in Barcelona brought an action. What does it mean to you? 0345 6060973 and am I bonkers? Don't just ring in and answer that like cold with specific reference to this story. That 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 idea, whatever you do for a living, if you had some form of protection from competition, from unfair competition, um, if you had some form of protection from it, and a government essentially turned around and just removed it, you'd feel horribly aggrieved. So why haven't we managed to move behind taxi drivers on this issue? Is it simply because, yeah, it's very sad that they've had their pockets picked. Christmas now is not the, 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 the time of milk and honey that it used to be for cab drivers. It's tough, tough times. A lot of driving around for hours, getting a fraction of the fares that they used to get. You can get your violins out if you want. But for me, this is about the protection of rights, the protection of protections. And whatever you do for a living, if they were allowed to turn around Oh, man, we're back to Brexit, aren't we? Because the Prime Minister refuses to, to commit to protecting the rights that we've currently got under the um, European Working Directive. I, 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 God, I hope 2018 proves me wrong about everything. But it looks as if the European Court of Justice today has proved me right about Uber. I'm getting sick of being right. Where we respond, I think, to the news that Uber is a transport company and not... A technology app, they argued the latter. Um, Spanish taxi drivers based in Barcelona sought to argue the former, and they have prevailed. It is not an information society service, as they claimed. It is a cab firm, and, and therefore will obey all local taxi rules in all markets within the European Union where it operates. Tony's in Abbey Wood. What do you reckon, Tony? Yeah, hello, James. Morning. It's a pleasure to talk to you. James, um, uh, I'm all over the place with this. I'm a London black cab driver. And I, and I voted Brexit. Yeah. Um, and I was in the building game for years, and because of the higher numbers of um, Eastern European workers that came in, I was basically put out of work. I could no longer work for the prices that they were prepared to work for. Well, so what, what was your skill? What, what did you do? I'm a carpenter. I'm okay. a carpenter. There's massive um, shortages for carpenters at the moment. Well, yeah, I should have stayed in it. Eighteen percent, eighteen percent of our um, construction workforce is EU now, and um, of course, there's big exactly. fears and big reports that a lot of them are leaving. So, yeah, what year was it? What year was it when you felt that that you'd been squeezed 2010. out? Twenty ten. Twenty ten. So, so you're relatively new to the knowledge then. Well, I've done it. I've, I've, I've took four and a half years, and it cost me forty thousand pounds. I went working <laughs> part time for the last. Yeah. And that, that's the truth of it. It took me four and a half, and it's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And when you see what, what has gone on in London, and it, it can be nothing else other than corruption. How can... Corruption is illegal. Uh, and, and it, right, exactly. Well, and I, 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 but no, but I can't let you accuse I can't let you accuse individuals of crimes because not, it I, would be I, libelous. I haven't accused an individual. No, I know. I was worried that you might be, be about to. Else. No, I'm not going to, Good. but there can be nothing else. But how a company that has been illegal from for, since day one. The driver accepts the, the job, not Uber. It gets backfilled later. That is illegal. Had, well, this is what had, this is what Theo Usherwood has been reporting on this morning, isn't it? This is the TFL end of the story, not the ECJ. Guys, so many acronyms, isn't it? It's A-OK. -okay. And TFL, TFL are in partnership with Uber. No, well, I disagree problem. with you on they that because TFL have suspended Uber. No, no. Well, no, they, no, they have, no, Tony. It's a ruse, James. It's not it's a, a ruse, ruse. It's a suspension. <sighs> yeah, well, and they're still and they're still selling seven hundred licenses a week. Look out your window and see the swarm of Priuses in London. I know, I'm, I'm well aware of that, but there's no way T, there's no way TFL. Listen, I, I just I, I agree. I imagine with most of what you say. The people at the top of TFL that, that yeah. were instrumental in getting Uber into town, they have all gone. They've all left the sinking ship. Is it a bit like the police? If you resign, you get to keep your pension. No, you see, you've, 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 you've lost me a bit now. So the question is, what well, do you they, think... They've the, all gone. Well, stop all talking, people. Tony, and listen for a minute. What do you think the European Court of Justice ruling means for you? Right, I don't know what to do now, because I was a Brexit, but and now I'm thinking the Tories are going to use Brexit to get rid of all our rights. Of course they are. But I told you that all along. Why weren't you listening? <laughs> I know. James, I voted Brexit because of what I saw with my own eyes. Nothing nothing racist, nothing xenophobic, 
it happened to me. I just saw my job go because of the huge swathe of Eastern European people that came to this to this country. And, you know, fair play to them. They do the job. But, but they put me out of work. We've had, we've had, under the last Tory government, I remember I was, I was working. I got given... We're getting distracted um, again. What does this European yeah. Court of Justice mean to you? Looking forward, not backwards. I, I don't know now how to go with Brexit anymore. Am I for it's too late, it? mate. That ship has sailed. What, what you get from this ruling is an understanding of what a supranational judicial body can do. It can overrule in the basis, on the interest of basic fairness, like it's about to do in Poland, because it is dedicated to resisting the rise of fascism and far-right totalitarianism. It's about to give Poland an almighty slap. And it's done the same with Uber. And, and you voted to remove ourselves from the jurisdiction that can um, overcome national bodies and, and instead is, put supranational. There, is one, great thing, there is one great thing that came out of the Brexit thing. Go on. And that was Cameron and Osborne going. How many of your lot, how many taxi drivers do you think voted to hurt them and in so doing, perhaps without realising, uh, hurt that themselves? Was instrumental in, that was instrumental. But, but James, you... Oh, so I it's like you've thrown a punch. You've thrown a punch at David Cameron and you've managed to sort of thwack yourself in the cheek as, as, as the fist flies past your hand. So you've landed a punch yeah. on them, but yeah. you've also punched yourself in the gob. James, I'll go and do something else. Go, well, what? Of us, if we go, I'll do something else. I'll, I'll, I will change my job again. You go back to carpentry, mate. You They're going to be crying out for you. Yeah. We've got a house building project underway and we're scaring away all the workers. I was the best chippy in London. Of course you were. Uh, I've got another question for you, just to fry your head before you go. If, um, if, if the, the, the future holds some form of departure of all the workers that you claim did you out of a job, I've got no reason to doubt you. Some of the statistics don't support you, and the vacancies now suggest you should have hung around for a little bit longer. But if all of these Eastern European carpenters head back to their countries of origin, what should happen to the national insurance contributions that they've been making for the last nine years? The national insurance, what should happen? Yeah, all of these people. I just think, because what I do when I talk about Uber is I put myself in the boots of a cab driver. I try to imagine how I'd feel as a cab driver uh, about what's happened. So I'd ask you, the carpenters that you think squeezed you out of a job have been paying national insurance in this country for the last nine years. Do you think they should all get it back? I have no opinion on that, James. I haven't worked that one out. I've not had time. I'll, to leave, it. That I'll leave it with you, Tone. Yeah, leave that one with me, yeah. It's 24 minutes after 10. Steve's in rice lips. Steve, what would you like to say? Just, just following on from what your um, colleague, uh, your caller just said, yes. uh, there are plenty of taxi and private hire who can't do another job. Even if they apply for other jobs, when they put in a CV and it says private hire or taxi, they're considered lower than they already are now. Why? So, um, why? Because, unfortunately, the public treat drivers with disdain. Um, well, no, that's, that's two separate things, though. I mean, you, you can say the public treat drivers with disdain, but why do employers consider it to be, an un, to be a, a negative on a CV? I, that I can't speak to, but I think it's the fact that they can't see any practical experience in the, in the sphere they may be trying to go into, and therefore they, they, they get passed over. I, I suggested to somebody recently they try um, doing two separate CVs um, to, to try and prove the point. So we'll see how that, how that turns out. Um, your main question was, what does the European... Yes. Um, in, uh, you know, mean to, to, to people? Well, um, for, for people like... Um, and well, I'm actually for professional drivers and GMB, so from my perspective, um, it stops this um, flim family, for want of a better phrase, um, of, of what we are today and what we are tomorrow and all of this parlance where one day uh, we're a tech company and it's Uber BV and another day it's Uber Britannia and another day it's Uber London and it, yeah, everything's sort of mixed up in smoke and mirrors and, and nobody quite knows what the story is. So what's the story it's, now? What happens now? What's the well, good news today? Well, well, I think the, the, the good news is um, authorities can now act, you know, be they local or national authorities, can act with, um, um, with some clarity over how they deal with legislation and how they um, ask Uber and other organisations um, to, to behave. You know, there's, there's other companies who are not necessarily playing the correct rules here, um, and that is a concern. And it doesn't just relate to Uber drivers. You know, we've got situations where drivers are concerned about get, get and my taxi fixed rates or being kicked off platforms um, with, with similar worker control problems. Mate, with, I, Steve, with, with respect, I, I, I'm not asking complicated questions, but my goodness sure. me, you, you're answers are taking me around the house.
houses. If this was a taxi fare, I'd be fair. demanding a refund, mate. Seriously, why can't we just go from A to B in the shortest amount of time possible? As I see it, the European Court of Justice rule ruling will mean Uber have to have to treat their drivers with with a little bit more dignity and respect. They'll have to put in workplace protections. We look back to that tribunal case still unfolding, where holiday pay and sick pay, things like that, which of course will will mean that the the the, the playing field becomes a little more level. Well, I hope so. I mean, there's 167 um, you know, GMB members who He's are... off again. No, who are in that tribunal. <laughs> I, know, I, know, I know there are, yeah, so yeah. we should watch yeah, with yeah, interest. Yeah, yeah. Steve, so, I'm going to well, crack on. I understand your interest in this, and I'm grateful for your insight. Ted is in Walthamstow. Ted, what's going on? Oh, James, thanks Hello, for having Ted. me on. Yeah, um, so, yeah, this is... This, I mean, you know, it's a complicated uh, issue, and, you know, we talk about it all day, but just to get to uh, the bare bones of it, yes. we've got to look at how Uber has operated as a business, what's been their strategy from the beginning. Um, and I think what's happening uh, in the last year or so with the bad publicity and the recent court rulings is, uh, well, they're getting, you know, they're getting a bucket of cold water thrown in their face uh, and they're slowly having to wake up and smell the coffee. Why, 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 why do you think that is? I don't, because I, it seems to yeah. me, and, and I, I, I'm beginning, I'm having a bit of a crisis, Ted. Have you, have you got a minute? I'm going to confide in you, mate. I, what, what were we talking about yesterday? Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, who I still I still don't see that what other people see. But I'm beginning to worry that even a sort of vociferous critic of right-wing propaganda such as me has in some way been conditioned by right-wing propaganda. Because I sit here and I think, I, don't, I honestly don't believe that senior politicians who've ended up getting paid £650,000 a week for one day's work, I honestly don't believe that there's any sort of quid pro quo going on here. But as the words come out of my mouth, Ted, what the hell qualifies George Osborne to get six hundred and fifty grand a year for one day's work a week? He's a, he's a, he's a, I think he's a history graduate who presided over an economic disaster. So if it's not a quid pro quo, what is it? I, I was ringing it to talk about Uber. I know, but I'm, I'm going. I'm go, I've gone off on one, Ted. I yeah, just I can't yeah, yeah. quite make sense well, of it well, all. Well this, well, this is this is the problem. Everything's so tangled up, you know, from such a mess. I mean, what I was going to say is that right from the beginning, I think Uber's strategy has to be, has been to be brazen and bullish and to come into the market and treat rules and regulations and effectively laws as more of a game yeah. claimed uh, rather than an actual sort of social contract or, you know, um, basically the law. They've treated it as, uh, as a game and they've seen themselves as you know, uh, sort of pioneers of technology. They've built one up. They've built up this sort of mythology about themselves, and they've used their political connections. We know that they really have, haven't they? There's no. I mean, it's so naive of me to think that these things can't happen in Britain because we're the mother of all parliament. No, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, business and industry is always going to uh, have uh, you know some some kind of uh, connectivity with with the government of the day, and that's only natural. You know, trade unions would argue the same thing. Yes. Uh, that they should also have that... Act. Damn those unions the sticking politics. up for workers' rights. <laughs> well, you know, it's just, it's just a balance, and I think they've used their political connections and, you know... So what happens next? I think you're right. I'm late for the news. What happens next? Uh, so what happens next? I mean, you know, we've seen the court rulings lately. You, we know what happens. Uber appeals the case and it drags on for years, but this is, you know, the European... Court of Justice. Court of Justice. How did you vote in the referendum? I voted to remain. Oh, right. uh, I'm a black cab driver. And I'd like to say, I think, you know, I get a lot of comments from passengers that sort of seem to think that black cab drivers are all pro-leave. I don't want to go down the arguments of... No, I'll do it uh, for you. I've got, I've got your back on that. I've got your back on that. Of course, of course you're not. But I mean, it probably breaks down roughly as, as, as the whole country did. If, if not differently, actually, there might be a majority of black cab drivers who voted to remain because a vote to leave was essentially a vote for fewer passengers, potentially. But, but of course, the problem is, as with all of the Brexit-related debate, the loudest, nastiest voices are on the leave side, which means that people get distracted by their volume and their nastiness and, and forget that ordinary decent people don't feel the need to shout their opinions from the rooftops every 20 minutes. So, yeah, you're, I, I, for the record, I should make that absolutely clear. When I say it's going to be funny to listen to Brexit voting cavies try to make sense of this one, it's in no way meant to suggest that there is a preponderance, a majority, or um, e even a quorum on that in that profession of that political position. And, and I know this because I, well, I can't walk through London at the moment without fellas leaning out of their taxi windows going, all right, James, thanks for all your support. I voted Remain, by the way. James, I find it ironic that I voted Leave because I couldn't bring myself to vote for Dodgy Dave. And now the very people I voted to separate from have come to my aid, says Steve the Cabbie. I'm not sure. I and mean, that's how it looks at first glance. But, of course, um, we only remain under European Court of Justice 
jurisdiction until the well either March 2019 or the end of the transition period depending on which way the wind is blowing today so uh, cautious optimism Steve but of course um, you voted to take power away from the European Court of Justice and give it back to um, well, I suppose British courts which wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing but it's a supranational jurisdiction which means that Uber have to abide by these rules in 28 countries um, that's almost as if it's almost as if the negotiating power of a block containing 28 countries and consisting of the largest free market on the planet it's almost as if they have more power than a than a country like the United Kingdom, however wonderful we may be. I don't know, I'm just putting that out there, just as a, as a controversial um, provocation, that possibly the largest single market on the planet has more negotiating power in almost every imaginable field than any member state would on its own, which is why the union exists. I, I, I just call me, you know, eccentric. But if you had 600 million people in your team and you're going up against a team with 60 million people in it, then on what possible field do you think you'd have the advantage by having 60 million players versus their 600? I don't know. I'm just, just putting it out there. Mark's in Knightsbridge. Mark, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Hello, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not a London taxi driver. Mate. I spoke to you before. Um, uh, you know, you, you've been a great friend to our trade, James. James. You know what's been going on. And I, I voted Brexit, but... You know, as probably a lot of other cabbies did, I voted with my heart rather than my head. Yes. You know, I mean, I, uh, I trained for four and a half years to the knowledge of London. It's, it's a, as, a, as any cabbie will tell you, it's the, it's, it's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Yes. You know, and I, I was led to believe at the end of it, you know, I'd be able to. All I wanted to do, all I want to do, is provide for my family. You know, and now that has nearly been taken away from me. You know, and so yeah, I, I voted Brexit, but. I don't know. As you said, it was was I sort of punching myself on the nose? Is it, is it Tyson time? Fury? Who's the clip of when when the heavyweight boxer takes a swing and somehow misses the bloke he's taking a swing at and ends up almost knocking himself out? There's a f sort of very viral clip on the internet, and it's a yeah, little unfair. I, I, I don't know. If, yeah, I know. I know who you're on about. I think that might. I'm not sure if it was Tyson Fury though. <laughs> no, I'm not either. But, but that's I mean, that's how it looks yeah, from where yeah. I'm sitting. I mean, to, stick, to see our trade be ripped away from us like this, it's just been heartbreaking, mate. It's been nothing less than heartbreaking, and. And, and I won't mention any names, right? no. and it's just, it's just corrupt, mate. It's just awful. I, I can't get past that word, because I, I, I'm trying to think of another field in which yeah. you could be part of a government that essentially shafted men and women like you, brought in a company that the workers don't really benefit from membership of. The, the drivers, the Uber drivers are not coining it in or living it up by any stretch of the imagination. The only people that will, potentially the investors, they're losing billions as a loss leader in the hope of securing some sort of monopoly. I don't think you need to be Jeremy Corbyn to look at that and conclude that there is some master plan in place and politicians have played a part in bringing that plan to fruition. Well, I, I mean, and this fella comes over from America, apologises, says he's sorry, in the full knowledge that, 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 that all his customers in London are being hacked. I mean, it's, it's just That's a very good on, point. I mean, That's a very good point. I, I have a problem, though. and My, my problem is that I, my political yeah. credo, my whole political position is built upon a belief that unchecked um, ownership, unchecked capital is to the detriment of everybody except people who've got loads of capital. That doesn't make me a Marxist. Yeah. It doesn't even make me a socialist. It just makes me a, no, a, a believer in managed capitalism. And when I say that the European Union historically has been a bulwark against unchecked capitalism, it's been a great champion of workers' rights, whether or not it's the European Working Time Directive or whether or not it's some other areas of, of legislation. Yeah. And... and I, I didn't do as much in the run-up to the vote as perhaps I should have done, but it's always been fairly clear to me that right-wing governments don't like any of that stuff. They don't like trade union yeah, representation, yeah. they don't like yeah, workers' right. rights, they don't like anything that puts a break on how much money they can take out of the pot at the end of the year. Donald Trump's just slashed corporation tax in America for exactly the same reason. So. I, I don't know what to do next, mate. I, I don't know how to persuade people that, that we should all be on the same side instead of tearing each other apart. I do understand. It's not just our trade. It's happening. No, I know. The postman uh, and yes. to see the post guy going away is just is just unreal as well. So I do understand. It's not just us. I'm not living in a bubble. But but to, to, to be. To have this taken away from me when after what I was promised, it's yeah. just a travesty. So that's experience. what it's always been to me. It's always seemed fairly simple. It's not you didn't you're not asking for the world. You're just asking yeah. for the rules and the regulations and the protections that were part of your decision to do this training. 
Yeah, totally agree, mate. Totally agree. <sighs> Hang in there, Mark. Second referendum, what will you do? Last Christmas, mate. Hang on. Uh, sec sorry, mate. Second referendum, what are you going to do? Well, if, 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 if it means I get to be, be the great cabbie I once was, then I'll vote, I'll vote to stay, mate. <laughs> that. It's 10.39, you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Also coming up on the programme today, we will... I, I'm kind of drawn towards the story about people in Bristol putting spikes on a tree to stop birds landing and doing their business on the expensive cars beneath. But I, I'm not sure even we could get 45 minutes of engaging conversation out of that. We might well try come 12. The other story I'm drawn to is a simple question of whether or not we need whether we need more or less religion on the television. I always remember, I've told you this a billion times, sitting in the green room for the Alan Titchmarsh show, daytime ITV, a few years ago, um, before everything went a bit nuts for me career-wise, and, and I was glad of that kind of gig. And Anjem Chowdhury came onto the stage as a sort of pantomime villain. And I remember sitting there as the people in the audience, quite an elderly audience, and they were, they, they were booing and hissing, and, 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 and I thought, this is the only Muslim these people have ever seen on the telly. They think he's normal. They don't realise he's an absolutely ridiculous, and now, thanks to the way the tabloid press have lionised him, um, dangerous individual. It's, these people in this audience never see anyone else on the telly representing that faith. And, and I just thought then, maybe, maybe you do need more religious programming, but on the other hand, of course... <laughs> Religion, historically, does seem to bear some responsibility for an upsurge in conflict and tension. 0345 is the number you need to contribute to the programme today. Lewis is in Euston. Lewis, what do you reckon? Um, hi, James. Oh, um, I, I have to disappoint most of my colleagues who are listening. I'm a London taxi driver and um, branch secretary for RMT, London Taxi Drivers. Um, this European judgment is going to mean absolutely nothing for the London cab trade. Um, the European judgment is pertaining to Uber as a transport company uh, in the states where they are not regulated by the framework that governs taxis or private hire or minicabs. In London, they are required to have a private hire operator's licence. You're, are, you're quite right. It's, it's more, I mean, from my point of view, it's more that this will make life a little bit better for Uber drivers, which will mean that the costs have to come up if they're going to cover things like minimum wage, sickness pay and holiday pay. And if the costs come up, then the playing field for the black cab drivers gets a little more level. But I agree with you. It's not really champagne and party poppers time. Well, absolutely comment on the private hire sector. I know you had Steve Carlick on earlier to, to comment mm. on that, but um, what I will say is that even that, James, is ambiguous, because whether or not, just because Uber are considered a transport company doesn't mean they're actually employment practices, and that comes under employment law. So and that, and that is why the, tri the, the, the tribunal that's um, being, I think it's being appealed at the moment, isn't it, which, which has put those those positions in place. Is there any prospect of movement on the, on the hailing, on the plying for hire? thing because I, as I and, and you're going to know a lot more about this than I do but it seems to me what Theo unearthed this morning is is evidence of a not a deception necessarily but certainly a, a, a confusion about whether the booking for a car goes to the server then the driver or whether it goes to the driver and then the server if it's going to the driver and then the server it's plying for hire surely well, it's going directly to the driver. It's in breach of, uh, of the Private Hire Act. And, actually, and, and that it, it, looks it, like what they're doing. That looks like what's coming out now in the wash, doesn't it? Well, it does ostensibly, but the only way the ECJ judgment will, will help the cab trade is if Uber try to rely on the fallback position that they are not a uh, transport provider. They're just they're a, a tech service putting passengers and riders, uh, riders and drivers in yes. contact with each other. But well, that's yet to be seen because the, the, the case is ongoing and the appeal is not being held till April. But from the plying for hire perspective, James, from our union, it's always been the... Um, the exhibition of the vehicles via the application, and that can be tackled by the mayor and by Transport for London, and mm. it's being shirked by the mayor and Transport for London. Now, I have to say, and I'll throw the gauntlet down from the RMT taxi branch to yeah, Mayor Khan, on. that he can say, no doubt, from his press release, this is a wonderful, well-received decision from the ECJ, and, and London uh, respects it. But what the London mayor, we expect him to do, and TfL, is to abide by the 300 years of practice of the London taxi, which exhibits its availability and plies for hire, and that's a differential in London. And well, you, I, 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 you're, you're preaching to the choir. London, no, it isn't, though, is it? Because it went to court and TfL won that case. No, they didn't, James. They want to meet a case, not applying for hire cases. You got, yeah, no, no you're absolutely right. No, I just, what am May I talking I about? This is my position you're describing. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Why am I arguing with you? Well, please don't argue. <laughs> please, please get my last point in, Go on, James, of course you can. Transport for London have always said that the plying for hire argument should be made in the courts and it's 
duty ban on transport for London as a licensed regulator to take that case to the courts. It's not incumbent on the unions or individual drivers. It's TfL and the mayor's buck, and they must stop with them, and they must implement that. Send me a proper email, will you? Because I, I, I want to get this all neat, neat and tidy before Sadiq Khan comes in the next time, all right? I'll send it to you, James. I'll stand the line and give it to your producer. Good man, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Good man. James at lbc.co.uk. Make sure Lewis gets that sent across. Make sure you get a copy of it. Next time Sadiq Khan comes in, we'll put it to him directly. I am